and uh, yeah hi guys uh, today's uh, talk is going to be on developing connectors on kafka connect and uh, for kafka and uh, what uh, so brief introduction as uh, uh, ramanathan mentioned about me is i'm working at as a senior software engineer here at confluent and uh, i've been with the connect team uh, from the beginning here at confluent i think i joined when there were like four people uh, here uh, uh, in the connect team and now we have grown to a size of 50 and we're still growing right and that's a like that's a nice journey to uh, go through actually and uh, during this time i've uh, developed several connectors uh, and uh, as well as you know worked on some monitoring aspects and uh, security aspects for connect and we offer this connect on confluent cloud as well that's an offering from confluent uh, uh, yeah I'll, i won't do any pr here but uh, yeah i worked on the monitoring and security for that and uh, i've i've been i graduated from wits as a computer science uh, and a math major uh, and i've always interested about uh, di distributed systems and modeling these systems right uh, so that's what got me at confluent and even my previous experience has been around uh, distributed systems so yeah that's kind of about me uh, today's agenda we'll uh, just uh, touch up on uh, uh, kafka and kafka connect uh, then we'll do a little bit of a deep dive and then uh, and since as i said we try to kind of uh, keep this a little interactive session and uh, online sessions it becomes a difficult job to kind of do live coding for example so i'll i'll try to focus more on the i'll try to focus on the code but i'll use my slides more than uh, you know uh, running the code for today and that would hopefully give you guys more idea and a head start so that after this session you can actually go ahead run the code uh, modify the code and what not right and i'll try to share the code uh, uh, you know by after this session so yeah we'll start with uh, kafka and kafka connect then we'll do a little deep dive into kafka connect itself and uh, its connectors and then we'll look at the uh, you know interfaces what uh, ka ka kafka connect provides for us to write connectors and then we'll uh, study use case uh, for writing a twitter source connector uh, and yeah we will discuss we'll discuss more of what source and what is the, what is a connector uh, uh, during this session Uh, so yeah i think we we have a couple of people only a few people today i think around seven attendees today so feel free to unmute yourself and let me know if you have questions at any point of time right i mean if it's a bigger quorum it becomes difficult to take questions in the mid but uh, i'm more than happy to take questions today in the mid but uh, if you have any more like you know detailed questions we'll keep it towards there i hope that makes sense and uh, let me know if i can start sure please sure, go please go ahead. yeah cool all right let's let's start uh, so first uh, apache kafka so what is kafka kafka is an open source distributed event streaming platform and it's typically used for high performance uh, real time data pipelines so there are a lot of uh, buzzwords here uh, let's try to dice it up a little bit more uh, so what are events right so what are events for apache kafka and uh, what is this uh, streaming platform Uh, so to, today, if you see, uh, almost everything is becoming more real time, right? You have you know real time events coming up. There are you know uh, people you know constantly. For example, uh, example which I always use and it's kind of easy to explain is uh, ordering uh, food, right? So there are hundreds of millions of people ordering food at any given moment in this world, and a bunch of apps which do that. You know, Zomato and Swiggy being uh, one which is popular in India, and there are these events which are happening uh, at at any given point of time, and that event. particularly triggers some other action you know you order a uh, uh, you know food from one of the stores that it triggers an event to to the store itself saying that oh there's an order being placed similarly it also triggers an event for the delivery guy to you know go start uh, you can you can move towards the pickup point to pick it up and deliver it here so there are these events which have become very popular uh, and earlier if you notice these this wouldn't like if you see you know few years you know about uh, 10 years ago or uh, events are something which are not something which are pretty popular you know you have a particular set of data and you're pro processing that data in a offline mode there's nothing the uh, event based uh, per se and uh, what streaming over here is you know you want to process this information in a immediate fashion you know you have events but you want also want to process them in the real time so that's where apache kafka comes into picture it's a distributed platform which lets you you know stream these events process the, these events at near real time as they are occurring right and uh, so yeah kafka stores and you know lets you process these events uh, uh, in a fault tolerant manner it means since it's a distributed system if anything uh, fails over time you can still be reassured that uh, your data is available or at least you can retrieve it uh, over time uh, however uh, accurately you want it to be and uh, these are key value pair events which are key value pair data which is stored in kafka 
uh, we have a co concept of producers which write these events to Kafka. As you know, you know, you want to write these events into Kafka, and there are consumers which the which read these events. So with producers and consumers and Kafka in picture, this allows like a real time processing of these uh, data streams which are getting. For example, the order uh, data which we are getting, right? So how does this look in a picture, right? So you have you know producers on one side of the uh, uh, picture, and then you have uh, uh, and then you have consumers on the other side of Kafka. So this is the Kafka in between. So Kafka has concept of like you know topics, and topics are where you store data. And you know, producers can be a single guy who is writing a particular event, or it could be a set of uh, uh, producers talking with each other or coordinating it with each other to write events to a particular topic. That's also possible. You know, the par parallel writes are possible. At the same time, there are consumers which are reading data from these topics. So again, consumers can also form their own group and parallelize how well they want to read the topics. I'll not go into details into uh, more into topics, but there's a concept of partitions, which is the level of parallelism these consumers can uh, consume from so this is like the basics of kafka you know there's producers there's consumers there are topics where the data flows through so you can kind of imagine the data is coming through producers going through kafka and uh, you know going out of uh, out via consumers and there can be multiple consumers consuming from a single topic as you can see multiple producers producing to a single topic so one order can be consumed by both the uh, uh, customer, uh, sorry, but it can be it can uh, be consumed by the customer. It can be consumed by the delivery guy, and it it can also be consumed by the restaurant where you're ordering from. So you can see Kafka kind of forms that nice backbone where everything kind of meets in. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know if you're following Marvel, but uh, anyway, so the recent uh, spoiler uh, kind of thing is like basically they show how timelines kind of collapse into a single timeline. How do you kind of you know, streamline things over here. And that's where the streamlining comes into picture that all the data is flowing into one topic and getting consumed from there. All right, so this is Kafka Kafka basics. So now what you can see here is the producers and consumers, right? And you can see every time someone wants to get data from somewhere, they'll have to write their producers and they'll have to write their consumers. But then you see with the current uh, uh, you know, systems, what we have in our software, right? there are a lot of systems to get data from. You know, easiest to talk about is databases. So you have databases in each company storing tons of data and they're getting updated at any given point of time. Uh, similarly, there are other systems, more uh, you know, modern systems like you know, functions and whatnot. Right? So you have an event and you want to trigger a function downstream or you have an event and you want to you know, uh, store that into data lake downstream. That, that, that's a consumer right you want to consume that data and you want to store it from later analytics for example you're having orders and you want to you know consume that order and uh, store it into data lake let's say snowflake and you want to process you want to an analyze that data over time so you can see that there's some form of you know some set of source systems like you know databases or some form of sync systems like data lakes where you want to store this data and this becomes a more common pattern as we as people start using uh, uh, kafka and that's where kafka connect kind of comes into picture so you need a scalable system to stream this data. You can't keep writing produce, you know, applications based on these producers and consumers from scratch every time. It would be really good to have a framework to write on. And at the same time, you want to make sure that these producers and consumers are also fault tolerant. You, you typically wouldn't want to miss events, right? Uh, that could cause a failure downstream and whatnot. So your aim would be not to miss these events. You want, you want fault tolerant and quick recovery whenever any issues happens. And you want this movement to be reliable, as I said. So this is where Kafka Connect comes into picture, and Kafka Connect was a you know, uh, it's a distributed framework written around Kafka. So how this looks like, right? I mean, the previous picture kind of collapses into something like this. Uh, so you have a data source, which we discussed, like you know, databases, for example, and then you have data sync, which could be your data lakes. And so you can see data source is where you're consuming your data from using something called as a source connector, and then you're writing that data to Kafka. And from Kafka, a sync connector could consume that data and write into data sync. So as you guessed, right, underneath clearly source connector and sync connectors will have producers and consumers, but it's well abstracted for the developer who is writing a connector or even a customer or a, you know, a user who is using a connector to get data from a source and to Kafka. Uh, Kafka, right. And uh, yeah, before I do a quick deep dive, any questions from anyone? So there is no, there more, is no publisher, more publisher, subscriber, subscriber. Topic, topic, those things, those, are things are those things still exist, but it can be very well abstracted from the users. 
using this so the publishers and consumers still exist underneath that's how the whole thing function that's the bread and butter for kafka but that's very well abstracted topics would still kind of be re remain because you would want to see your data uh, but still uh, it's e more uh, cleanly abstracted you don't need to worry okay what is the name of the topic and what not to write to okay okay so instead so of instead writing, of writing consumer, consumer and producer, producer you will, you will, you will configure, configure connectors. connectors yes you can you know write a consumer and distribute it and anyone can configure that connector oh okay oh, thanks. thanks yeah so yeah it also gives that nice packaging aspect right you can you know you can create a connector and you know send it to your peer or you send it to a different company or you can give you know and uh, that can be used directly on this framework. Yeah. So the deep dive will discuss a little bit more how this framework itself works. So yeah, so this Kafka Connect uh, itself is a distributed system. Now you know, you know, Kafka itself is distributed system. Now you're seeing Kafka Connect is distributed system. And I mean, when does it end? Uh, unfortunately, it looks like it never ends. But uh, we need those guarantees today. Uh, we want to process a lot of data, but we want to do it reliably. And uh, whenever reliability comes into picture, distributed uh, systems kind of provide a very good mechanism to do that. So typically it's just deployed and you know it works in a distributed mo model. So as we discussed in Kafka, there's a distributed Kafka here also. We'll have a distributed connect cluster and we will see how it looks like in the next uh, slide. And uh, this connect itself, as you know, it writes data to Kafka using this connectors, but it also needs some metadata. So it stores this metadata in Kafka as well. So how does that look like, right? So this is how the previous picture kind of unfolds into right. So what we have is data source and data sinks, which which is kind of hopefully clear for most of the folks. Now, if we look a deeper, get a deeper look into connect uh, connect itself, right? So we have a Kafka connect cluster here, and we have a set of uh, uh, you know entities called workers, right? So there's a worker one, worker two, worker three. All of these three form a cluster or a group, and they talk to each other in a distributed fashion. And uh, you know, as we discussed, there was a source connector in the previous image, and there's a sync connector in the previous image. So we have these two connectors. So, for example, worker one is hosting source connector, and worker two here is hosting sync connector in this example, right? And let's say the worker one dies off. Uh, since it's a distributed system, the source connector will be spinned up in a worker two. And I mean, if that's that's the level of tolerance we have, we can tolerate up to two failures here because we have three guys. So if worker one and worker three also dies off. Both source and sync connector will start working on the worker two. So this is how you know the uh, fault tolerance and uh, speed recovery is provided, as well as the reliability is provided by the distributed mechanism. Uh, so yeah, let's let's dig even more deeper. Right, I'm trying to go down from a 10,000 feet view to a more 100 feet view because today we'll try to write a connector and understand what it takes to write a connector. Uh, so let's dig deeper into the source connector and sync connector themselves. You know. Uh, so yeah, connectors, you know, connector and instance. In this case, okay, uh, just to give background, both Kafka and Kafka connector are entirely written in Java. Uh, so that also means the connector framework which we are going to discuss today, or the connectors which are available today, are written in Java. I mean, do we have plans to write it in other languages? Again, unknown. But today, it's mainly uh, in Java. The whole framework is written in Java. So in this case, uh, uh, when I mean an instance, it's an actual Java object. Uh, so in this case, a connector instance, it defines and uh, you know creates a set of entities called tasks. And these are the tasks are the actual units uh, which do uh, the work of moving data. So if you if anyone is discussing a connector, right, you know, writing a new connector or uh, discussing how a particular connector works, what's more very important to discuss is what is the unit of work, which is task here. So how does the task work for a particular set of connectors? And uh, as I discussed, obviously, once we start discussing we have a concept of configuration. So easily used by anyone. So you will have a source and what kind of data should I fetch. So it's a configuration which is listed as this key value pair. And as I discussed earlier, this is stored in the Kafka metadata so that we have failovers. So for example, as we discussed, if source connect one, source connector dies and it moves to worker three. We would want to figure out, okay, what is the configuration that source connector was using? So we need to store that data reliably somewhere, and that's that's where Kafka is. Also, Kafka comes into picture today. So data is also moved to Kafka. Metadata is also stored in Kafka today. And the connect also has REST API through which we can manage the cycles of, you know, create connector, you know, delete connectors, or update the connector configurations, for example. So again, so this let's move to a hundred feet view, right? And let me know if this image is visible or should I go more full screen? 
so yeah we discussed source and sync connector and uh, let's call them c1 and c2 right and as i said each connector will have a set of tasks so if you can see here there is connector c1 and there's a task c1 t1 and there's a task c1 t2 which is in worker 2 so worker 1 and worker 2 are actually hosting workloads for connector 1 and similarly for connector 2 we have two other tasks which is connector 2 task 1 and connector 2 task 2 uh, again this uh, putting a 2 over here but there are two different tasks over here and they are being uh, you know distributed across different workers so you can see there is a, a level of distribution of work as well which connect kafka connect cluster does so that you have a nice uh, uh, you know distribution of task across all the workers which are available so it's a full use of the distributed system as well no one sits idle over there's no hot failover there are active failovers all at all, any given point of time so as we discussed if worker one does die what happens the c1 and c1 t1 and c2 t1 all of these move to the remaining workers so let me know if this is clear uh, before we move on to the next topic All right. So what we what we have learned now is you know you have there's a system called Kafka which is used for event streaming and there's a system called Kafka Connect which which is which you know uh, enables you to stream this data to Kafka. Uh, and how do you want to do it? Is what the connectors do. Connectors define what unit of work needs to be done and how that unit work works. So in the next few slides we'll again deep dive a bit more into these tasks and connectors. All right. So as we discussed, we want a, a you know quick recovery and uh, reliability, right? So in this case, what comes into picture is checkpointing. So again, going back to the previous example, if the worker one dies, you clear we can clearly see that task uh, workload, which is C1 T1, also halts because the worker is no longer available, uh, you know, for you to run the workload, and it needs to be a move. It needs to be moved to a different worker. Now, uh, how do you make sure that? You know your workload doesn't halt, right? Or you, how can you recover from that workload? Is where you would need checkpointing, right? So let's say there is you know hundred hundred uh, uh, records on the source side, which is the data source side. Or you know you, you have hundred records or hundred set of events on the source side which you are reading, and at the fortieth event or so, worker one fails. So you would want to typically start from the fortieth event itself, so that you don't replay the whole. Uh, uh, 1 to 40 data which have which have already read and reliably sent it to Kafka. So that's where the concept of offsets come into picture. And uh, this is where, uh, you know, this is what uh, Kafka Connect calls it. It calls it as offsets, which is used to support this checkpointing and failure recovery. Right. Uh, in case of sync connectors, which is, you know, directly consuming from Kafka, if you go back to the previous image, you know, sync connectors are directly consuming from Kafka. And Kafka itself has a concept of offsets because you know it stores events and it has a concept of okay, you know I've seen the fifth event and sixth event is being stored and whatnot. So sync connectors use those offsets, but when it comes to source connectors, we need you know a connector developer needs to define their own offsets. Let's let's pause for a moment and take an example over here, right? Uh, so let's say we are looking at a, a database, uh, you know, our RDBMS. So in case of RDBMS, we have tables and uh, you know database uh, uh, schemas and all. So what typically a connector would do is to read whatever data is being written to a particular table. So you know you have a table and you're writing data to the table and you're kind of reading each and every each and every entry in that table and you're sending it to Kafka, uh, uh, right? In a case, you know uh, the the task fails and uh, it comes back up. Where should we start from? So a typical, you know, use case could be, you know, you can use a timestamp, for example. Uh, it's not an ideal you offset, but uh, and if you have a timestamp field on your uh, uh, source side, uh, you can say, okay, I failed at timestamp T1, and when I restart, I need to start reading uh, whatever records we have read from time T1, right? Or let's say your table itself has an incrementing value, right? Incrementing column, right? So there are typically columns which have a UUID or an incrementing UUID where you can with where it keeps incrementing as you enter a record into it. Such a column could also be used as an offset. So let's say you have you know student data in your uh, tables and uh, there's an incrementing roll number, and you can use the roll number as an offset. So let's say the latest roll number you read were 100, and once you fail over and start back up, you will start reading from 100 and more. Uh, and that's the definition a connector needs to make when you know when it's being developed in this case. So any questions on the uh, uh, you know offsets and uh, uh, the tasks itself before we move into the code today? 
I would say let's, say move, let's on. move on yeah. and we'll, and we'll park for park the questions, for the questions later. later. Yeah, that, that's fine as well. All right, so now we have discussed task, we have discussed connectors and uh, whatnot. So let's see how these interfaces really exist uh, uh, today, right, in Java as well. Uh, so the first interface we have here, we are going to discuss is the connector itself. As I said in the uh, earlier slide, a connector instance defines what unit of task should be run, right? So these are the functions which a connector class, uh, you know, uh, kind of implements, uh, needs to implement. So one is a start, uh, which is called at the start of the connector, you know, whenever the connector starts for the first time. There's a task class. So this defines what unit of work needs to be run. What is the class which we need to use to instantiate a unit of task? And there is a method called task configs, uh, which is a list of tasks which we need to run. So as we discussed in a previous example, right, we had like two tasks which are being run. So C1 had two tasks. So the connector instance C1 would have instructed to the Kafka Connect framework that there are two tasks I need to spin up. So the list would return, you know, set of two configurations and we'll say, okay, this is the class T1, class T, which we want to run. So th those are the two methods which we are discussing over here, task class and task config. Uh, there's a corresponding stop method because whenever, you know, whenever a failure happens or whenever uh, uh, there's a external rest call to stop a particular connector, these methods are called start and stop. Uh, the rest of the methods will kind of come into as need basis, right? So there's reconfigure and this validate. Uh, we'll not cover this today. And there's also config method, which just returns a set of configuration. We discussed there's always a configuration associated with the connector, right? So connector method itself returns a set of configurations, which the connect the Kafka Connect framework can use to determine, okay, what are the configurations needed for this connector to work? So the next interface which we have is task. Again, this is the second unit which we have discussed uh, in today's example. And uh, uh, what we have over here is the task method. Uh, you know, it just has version, start and stop. Kind of feels a little anticlimactic that we discuss so much about task and offsets. And there's only two methods which we need to uh, talk about. Uh, that's not the case actually. This is an interface and we have a source and a sync interface. They have a good amount of methods which we need to implement. So for today's example, what we are going to consider our source system as, right? This is something which is kind of levels the field for anyone uh, uh, who's attending this session. It's something, you know, I considered a couple of systems. So two systems which kind of stood out and uh, most uh, developers would understand is, you know, Twitter and uh, Reddit. Uh, and unfortunately, <clears throat> both of these systems very recently came up with extremely strong API, uh, you know, uh, what should I say, API restrictions and pictures. It wasn't the case when I uh, implemented this uh, Twitter connector a uh, year or two ago when I was learning connector development rate. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead. But yeah, today what we are going to do is, you know, discuss a source. We are going to write a source connector for Twitter. And uh, before we well deep into Twitter, let's just discuss what the source connector itself entails. Right? So a source connector, a typical connector task, you know, uses a strategy of polling. So what we what a connector does is it pulls the external system to get data whenever requested from, right? And the developer establishes this idea of you know source offsets and source source partitions. So we discussed the case of a database uh, where the table was our uh, uh, you know source partition. So in the sense each task could particularly read from one particular table. So there are hundred tables. We could at max have hundred tasks reading from each and every table. So that's the idea of the source partition. So in a given partition, which is stable in this case, what is an offset? So this is a definition which we need to write. And we will get to that definition, what it could be in case of Twitter uh, connector, right? And until we get there, you know, feel free to ideate out, put it out in the comments and let me know, right? Uh, the third thing which we need to do or what uh, the source connector would typically do is to, you know, format this data. So if you see uh, in case of tables, that would be rows, right? And uh, rows are not something particularly Kafka understands. As I said, Kafka is a key value pair, data which is stored. So you need, kind of want to determine what's a key and what's a value. The value could be, you know, just the rows serialized into some format and key could be, you know, sometimes you would have primary keys on your table and that could be the key. Or sometimes it could just be an empty saying that, okay, this is just the data I'm trying to store. So that's a decision Kafka connect, uh, the source connector would do. So we discussed polling, we discussed, uh, you know, definition of offsets and partitions. The third thing is what are the format uh, which this data would be written into Kafka as. 
And the fourth thing is option, optionally, we might also want to tell the source system that we are done consuming. Uh, you know, if if you guys have used you know messaging systems uh, previously, right? You know, we have J, JMS and uh, uh, RabbitMQ, right? All these guys also kind of give us a similar data system of events and uh, uh, you know uh, real time uh, data in some form, right? So that's a messaging uh, event messaging bus uh, technology which was prevalent like a, you know a, close to a decade ago or more, like you know maybe even seven years ago, right? Six seven years ago. Uh, where you have uh, your events kind of stored in this event bus, right? Which uh, which Kafka is aiming to re uh, replace. So yeah, in these cases, what used to happen is these messages would be consumed once and needs to be acknowledged, and they're immediately de deleted from the system. So in such cases, let's say in this JMS case, you might want to read the data, and once you've sent it to Kafka, you want to give a acknowledgement back to this JMS system, saying that okay, you sent me a record, I'm done with that record, you can clean it from the system. Right. So optionally, a source connector can also do that. OK, so now that we know what source connector can do, it, it's easier to you know understand the interface of source task. And again, let me know if screen is clearly visible right in this case. So here we have a class source task, which has much more methods. We discussed the start method. So the start method is called at the startup of the you know, one time setup of uh, the task, you know, set up all your state and data to get ready for it. And uh, the one, the second important method here is the poll method. And poll is called by the Kafka Connect framework to see if there are any new records. So if there's no records, we just written saying that okay, null. There's no records. You can you can skip me and you can go to the next connector. As you said, right? As, as I discussed, right? There could be multiple connectors in a given worker. So each worker will check each and every connector for whatever data is available. So in this case, let's say the connector C1 is what we're discussing. So the framework will ask connector C1's task. So C1T1, is there any data by calling this poll method on it? We discussed this commit method right now. Uh, you know, you can commit all the records, whatever you have read till now. And there's a corresponding commit record as well, which basically says, you know, commit a particular record which we have read from the source system. And there is also the stop interface. So you can see the main difference or the main highlight I want to point out is the poll, uh, poll over here, poll method over here, which which seems like which will be doing the bulk of work for us today. I hope that is clear uh, uh, that the poll method is where we'll be doing the bulk of work of getting the data, formatting the data and sending it to the Kafka plane. Everything else is to manage the life cycles. Uh, so here you can see a particular uh, interface called source record that's of you know, interest. So let's look how the source record looks like, right? Uh, so the source record has us, it's just a container uh, uh, class which has a set of uh, information stored into it okay which topic this data this message or this record belongs to and what is the key for this uh, uh, record or this event and what is the value also along with it we may have some timestamp and headers all this is supported by kafka today and that's why it's it's a part of this record and particularly for source record we have this source partition and source offset as well which says what partition we are writing from and what is the offset for this particular record all of this uh, you know is kind of contained this in this source record class which is you know which as you saw previously kind of is part of the interface itself uh, yeah, as most of you would have guessed, corresponding to source record, there's also an idea of sync record, which will have different set of values, and we're not focusing on sync connector today. And uh, you know, I'll leave it as a more, you know, read about more about it uh, after this session. Uh, all right, and uh, the next thing uh, we'll move to is, I think, yeah, the, most of the interfaces are connect covered. We discuss connector, we discuss task, we discuss source task, because we're trying to write a source connector today. Okay, so let's move to our prime example for today, right? You know, we want to write a Twitter source connector. So what could the connector look like, right? This is where an ideation begins, right? So if you have to write a connector uh, in your company or uh, uh, for any other, uh, you know, project you're building and you're using Kafka. So a particular set of uh, things needs to be decided, right? Uh, in this case, what we have, the source system is Twitter. That's what we have discussed. And what could be the source partitions, right? So in my case, uh, I was trying to you know fish some data for COVID-19, and I said, okay, let's let the source partition be a set of hashtags, you know, hashtag COVID-19, hashtag USA, or hashtag you know uh, other events which are happening, right? So partitions in my case were defined by hashtags, right? So each task would be 
phishing for or you know looking for records from a particular hash containing a particular hashtag from the source system which is twitter here right so how do we get these records twitter provides us with an api to search these posts right and again unfortunately it looks like most of these uh, apis are now paid after this recent heist and we can't uh, i wasn't able to get my old connector uh, up and running uh, but i'll still post the uh, code for whoever can you know use the uh, uh, api keys or whatever keys they have to do this uh, api right so there's a search api which twitter provides for us to look for records and this is what we'll do but it's a very good case study because you can see there are set of partitions which exist like how tables exist for database the similar hashtags is what we use and uh, you know what are the source offsets uh, so there could be multiple things over here. We have multiple choices. As you know, there's always a timestamp associated with a tweet, right? If you're, if someone is tweeting on Twitter, there's a particular time at which uh, a tweet would have happened. And that could be the source offset. Uh, but uh, internally, Twitter also has a tweet ID for each uh, tweet that could also be used as source offset because uh, you know we could use a combination of these two to say, okay, I've, I, I know I've seen till tweet ID X, Y, Z. What are the new tweets we have seen after that? That's that's something that Twitter search API also provides us to query for, right? So that's why both of these are become a valid, uh, you know, uh, use case, valid uh, set of offsets which we can do. And again, this case study uses API v1. There's also API v2 which came up more more recently, and uh, API v1 was only using OAuth v OAuth one, and API v2 uses OAuth v2. All right. Um, any questions, or should I uh, move ahead with the implementation and uh, details of this, or any other comments? Right. You know, you guys thought differently of how the connector would look like, but I mentioned it. Thank you. I mean, we have some time, so I thought we can discuss so, it. So, yeah. what I what thought I was, thought was mm -hmm. these connectors would be readily available. available. Correct. And you are talking, talking about implementation. About implementation. Yes, I think to, today's uh, session is focusing on implementation, right? Most of the connectors are readily available, uh, but there's still some, you know, there could be still some systems for which the connector is not written yet. You know, there might be internal systems which uh, a company uses, which is not pro which is not open, which is proprietary, and someone wants to write a connector for that. So okay, this is, okay. yeah, this talk is to supplement that and, you know, kind of give a basic idea how do you write a connector from scratch. Okay, this okay, is a SDK. Yes. This is this is some form of an SDK. It's not it's not independent SDK. It's it's still bundled very strongly with the framework, but it's an SDK, correct? Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. And so yeah, again, as why I'm using Twitter as an example, even though probably there are enough connectors which exist for Twitter or Reddit, is because it kind of levels the ground. And uh, uh, database is also something which we could have taken an example, but it's much more involved compared than Twitter. Uh, so that's why I just took Twitter as an example to to show. Understand. Thanks. Okay. So the first thing to discuss, right, uh, for today, uh, is you know you know have this Twitter connector. As we discuss, each connector will have configuration, and I've you know used that word way too many times today. <laughs> so what we need to very important to describe is what this connector, how the configuration for this connector looks like. So you know. Going by the uh, spec sheet, small spec sheet I have uh, previously, you know you need to figure out what are the hashtags to look for. So that's surely going to be one uh, configuration, right? And now that you're using an API, APIs are typically authenticated, so you also need authentication. What authentication, uh, you know, uh, as I said, right, what, right? So you need some secrets which are used for authenticating against the Twitter API, uh, right? And uh, there's also this idea, right? You know, you're starting the connector for the first time. Uh, where should I start reading my data from? Like, for example, even in the database case, I'm starting a connector for the first ever time in my life. Where should I read it from? Should I look for new records being inserted or should I just dump everything available already on the database and then start looking for new events? Right? As, as you realize everything is in real time, so this is this event polling is happening at every instant. Uh, it's a long running job. It's not a batch workflow. Right? So yeah so in this case these are the configurations which we uh, which come up right one is obviously the hashtags we want to look for uh, the the api key uh, and corresponding secrets which are associated for us to authenticate right so these are the secrets which are needed to talk to the twitter api and uh, there is also the start date which you want to uh, you know optionally provide from where to start looking your tweets from let's say today or maybe it could be you know 
from the last five days can you start looking for all the tweets and keep you know giving me the latest tweets of covid 19 and maybe in the downstream i'm doing some analysis with it or maybe in the kafka itself we have uh, you know frameworks to do analysis on right as we are getting these records maybe we are just analyzing and seeing the sentiment okay what's the sentiment around uh, uh, covid 19 right uh, uh, you know, analyze these tweets and see, okay, are they happy tweets? Are they sad tweets? What's happening at this point? You know, you can do some form of prediction model as well as more as the real data kind of keeps, keeps streaming via this connector. Right? So yeah, you might want to say, okay, this is the last five days where I want to start from right? And the API itself has a restriction of seven days, right? So the best you can do is just last seven days. So these are the configurations which we have. And uh, since like, once these configurations are clear, uh, you know, the next interface which we discussed was something called the connector interface, which is this Twitter source connector interface, source connector. Uh, we would extend the source connector interface to implement the methods. So particular method which we discussed in the connector interface earlier uh, was, you know, the start method, the task configs method and the stop method, right? So we'll just focus on these three uh, things today, uh, which will just give a clarity, right? In the slides, at least we'll do a code walkthrough if we have time. Uh, right. I think Olivia has, has a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, hi. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, it's a bit of a hard uh, question. It's a bit of a hard question. Just live. Just live. Uh, one Sorry, second, Olivia. Child, you have to mute your mic. Uh, Everybody else is getting Everybody else is. Yeah, Olivia, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, just on the previous slide, there was mention of the picking the hashtags. And I was curious to know, for instance, in the context of COVID, is it case sensitive? Like, because some people write COVID all caps, some people write COVID with lowercase. Like when you're um, inputting it into this uh, code, for instance, do you need to do like both versions, for instance, or just kind of curious? Sure. He, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Right? I mean, uh, it's again depends on the use case you're doing, right? Uh, maybe you want to treat, uh, uh, you know, lowercase COVID and uh, you know, differently case COVID, dif uh, you know, in a different format, right? Uh, that could be use case, but at the same time, it's also a limitation from the API today that it's case sensitive. So the search, like you know, if you're giving COVID and uh, COVID nineteen, they're going to be two different uh, hashtags, and uh, the sensitivity matters. For example, in case of uh, Twitter. Uh, if suppose we had an API which could, you know, ignore the sensitivity or uh, we ourselves want to ignore the sensitivity, we could write the code accordingly, right? You know, search for all all possible permutations of COVID-19, for example. And that's a okay. choice okay. a developer typically makes. Uh, in this case, I, I took it to be case and uh, case sensitive. So whatever is the configuration we input over here, like COVID, that's that's what we're going to search for. Okay. Thank okay. you so Thank much. Thank you so much. No worries. Uh, going ahead. Uh, so yeah, if we're uh, discussing the source connector interface, right? So we'll, we were discussing the start method, and uh, so in case of start method, we don't have to do much in this in case of this connector. Right? We are not managing a lot of state because we have most of it provided for us already in the configuration. Uh, so we just get the configuration uh, up and ready for us. And the task class is what we would implement, which is this Twitter source task. Right. And uh, there was one more important method, which is the task configs method. Right. Uh, so in this case, as we discussed, the unit of work would be per hashtag. So we'll be, you know, looking for record. We'll be looking for tweets on a ha for each hashtag. So let's say we have if the configuration has four hashtags, uh, we would we could spin at max four tasks. So that's what we end up doing over here. Right. We kind of loop over uh, each and every hashtag provided to us and create a new new set of con new set of task configurations for the same and that's what is being written by this uh, method so let's say there are four hashtags this would return a, a list of four uh, configurations for each and every task each and every unit of work so the framework knows that we need four tasks so t1 t2 t3 t4 would be spent up uh, when this method is called and we realize there are four tasks right and uh, nothing to do again in the stop method. We're not using a lot of resources. It's just the task config methods, which becomes important over here. Right? You know, a particular example where start and stop could become important is again going back to the database example. Right? In case of databases, uh, uh, you may on a 
a previous note know what all tables exist but it's also possible that you know maybe you want to read from you know all the tables starting with develop devopedia right so any table starting with devopedia underscore you want to read from that uh, so if a new new table comes up we might want to you know recreate these task configs right so let's say we only have five tables now and we are we are looking for data suddenly the source connector uh, realizes that there is a sixth table which adds up you would want to return six tasks instead of four tasks so that's where start and stop could come into picture where in the start we are just you know uh, starting a background thread to look for new tables and in the stop method we might want to close that thread right that's a big example which could be used but in this case uh, uh, there's nothing we are doing on the source system side so we, we don't have anything in the start and the stop So the next uh, method we want to do is next uh, class we would want to discuss is task, right? Uh, we discuss connector, then we discuss configurations. The final uh, interface which we discussed earlier was task. So yeah, as we discussed, there's a search API which is provided by Twitter, which is a you know, V1 API for, and there's a similar V2 API as well, uh, where you, know, you could provide a set of uh, parameters to search from. Uh, so this parameter to search from a particular timestamp. There's a parameter to search for a particular ID. I, I mean, you can go ahead and look up uh, for the documentation uh, uh, separately for this. But yes, uh, this is the API which this connector uses. So what happens during the start? Uh, in case of during the start, we we would want to you know create this HTTP client to uh, read from this. Right? You just set up everything, whatever you have, so that whenever uh, a new record comes, you're just pushing it to Kafka. And uh, one thing which we discussed earlier, you know, cold start, right? In the sense, we are starting this connector for the first time. We might want to check, okay, if it's the first time, where should we start looking for data from? Last four days, last two days, last seven days, example. Or if this is not a cold start, that is, this task existed, uh, it somehow got failover, and we are restarting this task. Do we already have an existing offset which is stored? As we discussed in the previous slide, our offsets could be. Uh, either the tweet ID or uh, create a timestamp. And I think in this example, uh, we'll focus, you know, we'll use the tweet ID as an offset, right? Uh, yep, and this is the start method, right? This is where, you know, you start up, get all of your state ready, your things ready to, uh, you know, read for records. Now, what happens during each poll? Uh, I mean, just to give a refresher, uh, if you remember from our interface, uh, we had a poll method, which is what is being called to get the list of records. And this is being continuously called to get records. So yeah, what happens in case of poll for our connector? You know, each time a poll is called, we might want to look at the API, see how many more new, new tweets are there, process those tweets, and send these tweets back to the framework. And that framework will take care of writing it to Kafka. So yeah, so we'll we'll uh, query the API, get the records, then we pass these records and send it to, send it to Kafka Connect framework, and then you know maybe even handle errors over time. Right? We we need to make sure the connector is written reliably and it's uh, uh, recoverable. Right. So yeah, with these you know ideas in picture, how would the task look like? Right. Let's look at each function one after another. So the start function. Right? So as we discussed in the start function, maybe we want to just create the HTTP client to begin with. So we start with the HTTP client. And you know, configure it with the API keys. So we have a OAuth, uh, uh, you know, co consumer which can be used to authenticate uh, with OAuth, and that is what is being used to set up over here with the existing API keys and secret, which are, you know, which are getting from the configurations the that the user provides. So as a user, if you were using this Twitter connector and you provide a set of configurations, I'm just reading those uh, configs from here, which include you know the API key configs and the access key tokens, which are used for OAuth. Right. We also read this hashtag. So this is this is the hashtag which uh, you know which we are using for uh, uh, this uh, source task. Right. I think there's a typo here. I think the configuration here should be. Ah, yeah, it's the same configuration. Right. Twitter hashtag configs is what we are looking for, and uh, that's the configuration which we get from over here, which is a particular hashtag which we are right, trying to read from. Right. And uh, all right. And uh, so yeah, this is the uh, setting up the HTTP client part which we discussed. We also discussed uh, one more thing which we want to do in the start method, which is you know check offsets or for cold start. Uh, so in case of Kafka Connect framework, it provides you an interface to check for whatever are the latest offsets which are available for this connector, right? So we just query that uh, setting and see if there was a previous offset which was stored. So if there was no offset, it would be null. If there was an offset, we are just getting the last tweet ID which we have read. So this is not a cold start. Uh, this is a, a, 
recovery start and we would use the last tweet ID to read from. Right. So this is how the start method would look like. Now, once we have the start, uh, the major you know chunk of code and major chunk of efforts, you know, the whole development kind of goes towards this method, which is the poll method. Right? Uh, any questions till now? Uh, I think we have like 10 minutes, but uh, just uh, if there's any quick questions before I go into what we do in this poll method. Okay, so in case of this uh, poll method, right, as we discussed previously, what we want to do is, you know, create a request to this HTTP, uh, this uh, API Twitter provides, right? So here, you know, you get the URL and you sign the URL, which is, you know, authenticate, you add the authenticating parameters, which are these API keys, as I showed in the last, uh, last slide. Right? Now you have a request body created for you. So use this request body, and I'm using a, a Library, uh, HTTP library uh, from Apache Commons. So most of the things would look abstracted and a little more pseudocode. Uh, I, I kind of aim to do that so that people can understand, even if they're not very familiar with Java. Uh, but you know, just an abstraction over here for a request uh, to a HTTP REST API. Right? So we are creating a request for a particular uh, REST API, uh, the endpoint over here. Right, and once we have this endpoint, we try to execute, or basically we try to uh, execute this request, which returns a response to us. So in this case, we are just hitting that endpoint uh, v1 endpoint, and we are getting a response uh, response back from the Twitter API. Now, once we have this response, this response looks like a, a, a you know JSON object. Have this uh, open with <laughs> So yeah, so we have this endpoint which we discussed over here, right? The search endpoint. Let me zoom in a bit. And uh, in the search endpoint, there's a set of responses which come back, right? Which is the list of tweets. So there's a statuses, and each each item in the status is a list of tweets. For example, there's a tweet from NASA which is exploring the universe, right? And uh, there's a tweet from uh, again again NASA at a different point of time, right? So there's all these tweets are you know streamed and I mean all these tweets are given to us from the endpoint which we're querying, right? So we need to look at this uh, uh, data which we're getting from the endpoint and parse it. So that's what we do in this set of uh, in this in this code, right? We are parsing this endpoint, uh, parsing the response from this, and trying to get each and every status. So here you read through the whole JSON tree and get the statuses. And for each tweet, you process that tweet and create an entry into the records object, what we all have over here. And at the end, we re return this records object. So let's say we got 100 tweets from this API. So each tweet will be created into a particular set of records, and it's added to this list as a source record, and that is what is written. So there are these particular set of functions which I thought uh, if we have time we'll go uh, you know deep into, but I think we're close to time, uh, so we can take some questions or if all people here have time we can go into each and every function and have more details. But otherwise I'll try to share the code after this uh, session as well in the uh, meetup chat meetup page itself on Devopedia. Okay, uh, I think no questions are, uh, and uh, since we're limited of time, I'll just try to close towards this and we'll see uh, if you have more yeah. questions. Yeah. Towards this. After the after the question. Yeah. All right, so I had planned a code walkthrough, but uh, yeah, we, we, I think most high level of the code is discussed, right? Uh, what, what one needs to do if they're posed with this problem of writing a connector for a system, uh, what all interfaces needs to be implemented and what decisions need to be made, right? Uh, so that's what we would have discussed a bit more in the code walkthrough. Uh, all right. So what's not there over here? Right? Uh, we surely are not logging a lot of information in the code. The code is more of a pseudo code-ish, a lot of information. So whenever a developer is writing a connector, it's a good practice to log good information so that you know you understand if there are any issues or if it's working fine. Uh, at the same time, we don't discuss you know validating these keys which are given. Right. So whenever a customer is providing a configuration. An appropriate job to be job for the connector is to check if the configuration is valid before creating the workloads, right? So we are not validating anything if you look at our code. And again, as I said, right, we have a new API which has come up. Uh, 
typically we do want to move to this API with this connector, right? So this is something, this is also some problems which you would face as writing a connector, right? As you evolve it over time, what needs to be done, right? So what do we not covered in this session? I think we discussed a bit about this. We do not cover sync connectors as you, I mean, we did not end up covering sync connectors. It was focused more on source connectors. Uh, that's a good challenge to talk about. Sync connectors have their own channel uh, challenges. We don't discuss a lot about schema and converters. So we discussed that there's a particular, you know, format in which the data comes from the Twitter API, but there's also a particular format in which we need to format the data before sending it to connect framework. So that's where schema and converters come into picture. We don't cover that much here. And there's also configuration handling, which is validations, which we discussed in the previous page. And the more more supports, more you know, more uh, uh, more things this uh, framework supports, which includes transformations. You know, uh, there is dead letter queue for records, which you don't, which are not well formatted, for example. And there's also support for exactly one semantics, right? So if you if you would have seen, right, it's, it may so happen that uh, the Twitter connector fails over, and it may read a set of uh, tweets again uh, just because the offsets were not appropriate or the tweets were not yet completely uh, uh, processed right uh, so we, we also have support for exactly once which just means that every event is processed exactly once so you don't have duplicates uh, happening right so we have the framework also supports it but we don't discuss that in the interfaces today over here right so where can we read more i'll try to share this slides and the code and uh, you know you can read more about this you know the bunch of official guides for writing the connector there are blog posts by confront as well and uh, surely there are a few more medium articles but these are something which i have referred over time and i'm trying to uh, kind of put it across over here right even when i'm writing a connector new i, I do end up reading these blogs again and again to get a more decent idea right? uh, so yeah i think uh, that kind of ends uh, uh, the talk and uh, yeah, thanks. Any questions, any feedback? So people, so you, people can you can unmute yourself. yourself. Yes. I just want, I to, just say want to say thank you so much. And for providing the context with uh, Twitter and, and COVID hashtags, that was really great. Yeah, uh, you're welcome, Olivia. Thanks for joining the session. A quick thing from me. So whatever, yeah, whatever you, showed, you showed, the implementation was all on Java. So uh, any alternative uh, made available, Python, Scala, etc. Yeah, any Java and Java based languages could be used to uh, write this. So you know, Scala should work, but uh, the framework itself, the I mean. There's no particular, uh, you know, someone brought up a point about SDK, right? So there's no set of uh, set SDK given uh, in each language. There's only Java, which is available today from the framework, and that's what it supports. Uh, I hope I hope that changes over time, but uh, today it's just Java and any Java-based language like Scala or, or other stuff. Okay. 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 And, and one <laughs> more uh, question. Uh, I remember writing consumer. Uh, until consumer polls, the message is not read from the Kafka queue. Uh, is that still the same in the connector? Because you write sync connectors, are these automatic or still explicitly to be called? So yeah, this poll overhead is now taken by the Kafka Connect framework itself. So the Kafka Connect framework polls on the consumer to get the record. So it does that con continuously on the consumer. So that's kind of in some sense automated when it comes to uh, Kafka Connect. So it is almost in instantaneous. It it could be almost instantaneous, yes. Okay, okay. thanks. So others, please, if you have questions. Uh, 